president of engineering, Dustin Kirkland, is going to be walking us through the chain guard factory, which you would have heard a little bit about uh, during the keynote today. So I'll go ahead and turn things over to Dustin. We will have time at the end for questions, so keep that in mind. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> Uh, cool. So thank you uh, for joining us. This is the technical session. We can call it a factory tour. Uh, I once went on a factory tour when I was, I don't know, a teenager or so to the Corvette factory in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, and I still think back to that. What a cool experience that was. Once upon a time, uh, we've got a lot of analogies in here that, you know, sort of point to what we build uh, is a lot like a modern, uh, modern automotive factory. Um, so just an overview of what we're going to talk about uh, and hopefully what you can take away uh, from this. We built a new operating system distro designed from the ground up, completely modern, overwhelmingly using cloud technologies and automation in a way that has uh, provided tremendous advantages and opportunities to scale this and secure the entire software supply chain. That's a bold statement, but I'm going to walk you through some of how that comes together. At the heart of that is a factory, and we really call it that because flowing through the factory constantly is a ton of inputs. Source code, open source code, third-party libraries, compilers, tool chains, um, scripting languages, runtimes, all of that assimilates together into uh, a software system that our customers can then build and depend on, build their own software on top of and depend on in production. And then we're going to pull all of that together with what we call the chain guard operating system. And it truly is an OS from end to end. Uh, I would say now that we have added this capability to run uh, full operating systems inside of virtual machine environments and then stripe that across other OSs with our library's product. First of all, this is the hard part. We build from source. Yes, everything constantly. I want to make that part abundantly clear, especially for anyone who's maybe new to the chain guard story. We are not a derivative of any other operating system. We don't start with Debian or Fedora or Alpine or any other Linux and harden, harden that. Uh, and that's a little bit different than some of the other uh, alternatives to chain guards technology. We literally start at the source code, the tarballs or the git checkouts, uh, and build everything from scratch, including the compilers. We bootstrapped the actual uh, tool chain itself all the way down to GCC. And so a change in GCC, the C compiler that underpins almost everything, including Python, including uh, Java and C bindings, uh, we rebuild everything up from that. That takes a lot of, first of all, expertise, but a whole lot of automation uh, in order to, to do that. So this is a very, very important key point. We typically don't, except for exceptional cir circumstances, we typically don't backport patches from some cherry pick from head of the open source project and try to munge that and make that work with a code base that's months or potentially years and years old. Instead, we bring everything forward, fast forward, to the latest and greatest release. And in doing so, that's how we solve many security vulnerabilities that will go unpatched in other distros because it's just not practical, possible, or feasible to backport that really complicated patch to an older code base. Okay, So that's largely, uh, you know, I'll give you the secret, that's largely how we solve the lows and mediums. Right? The highs and criticals are you know, maybe possible with ex 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 um, excessive effort to backport. But the lows and mediums you can't even fix typically in, uh, in open source code without moving the entire code base forward. So that's how we, we solve that. Now, we can and do carry patches when we have to, uh, but it's typically, typically for a very small uh, period of time. It's usually just until that upstream maintainer tags a new release, then we can discard that patch and get right back onto the, the vanilla interpretation of that upstream maintainer's code. Uh, for the most part, you know, we, we, we have really good signals from maintainers who really prefer this approach. We're not creating some Frankenstein of the code that they've you know, put their heart and um, soul into developing and, build, developing and building and maintaining. Uh, what we've done is really just taken a secure snapshot of that, and we keep it moving um, forward. And if you've ever tried to file a, a patch or file a bug, excuse me, a bug against an upstream open source project, what does that maintainer typically tell you to do? 
right? Can you reproduce this against you know latest and greatest? Well, you know if you're on uh, some version that's four or five years old, it might not even be uh, useful for you to you know try to go and rebuild this yourself. Uh, but what we've got is actually really close to what the upstream maintainer uh, has shipped itself. Uh, so we start minimal. Uh, we fast forward. The third piece of the puzzle is publishing advisories, and a lot of them. Uh, we've got a couple of different advisory repositories. This is the one that maps to Wolfie, which was the open source uh, package repository that I showed you before. Uh, here we have some 1,200 files, uh, which are the advisory files. These are constantly growing YAML files with something like 17,000 commits and growing. Uh, every single day. This is what an advisory looks like. And these files can go on for hundreds and hundreds of lines. Uh, but I grabbed one for container D. Uh, container D will have this stanza that tags a particular unique vulnerability. You can see this is 2023, CVE 2023, 45, 283. There's a timestamp for when it was first found. Uh, our research, and this, this one did involve human research, was that it was a false positive determination, and we documented why. Uh, this particular vulnerability only affects code uh, in Windows. This is a container that is not running in, uh, this is not container D running on Windows. Therefore, we provide this, we publish this, we attest this, and then we feed that information to the scanners. The scanners read these advisory files, and the scanner itself is able to provide you, uh, the customer, the user of uh, container D, uh, scanning container D, with better information on is this actually a vulnerability? Because it's, it's no good if you just get this fire hose of information that is you know, unreadable. You know, if you're overwhelmed by false positives, you really stop to stop you know, trusting the value of, of your scanner itself. Um, this is something that you can't just DIY. Uh, you know, we, we, we're often asked, look, I've got a team, you know, we may be talking to a, a, a director of platform engineering, hey, I've got a team, they handle the vulnerability uh, uh, fixes. Well, what do they do? Well, they're constantly app get up, date app get upgrading or yum updating uh, our, our, our distro and you know we've got all the patches that the upstream distro has provided. Um, yeah, but what about the false positives? Well, I mean those we just kind of have to ignore. Um, becoming a trusted source of advisory data to the actual scanner itself, uh, that's a very privileged position and we're delighted to partner with um, Sneak and Wiz and Gripe and Trivi and X-Ray and, and Prisma uh, amongst others as well and provide those advisories to them in a machine readable format that's that's able to make the quality of that scanner information uh, even better. Okay, so with all of that we're able to build, test, sign, publish uh, packages as soon as any upstream project tags a release. Um, and so this is what happens. I showed you the, the, the first piece. This is what's actually happening inside of the testing. You can see these are 19 checks and growing uh, that we run. And you can see the, the whiz scanners are running. We've got uh, malcontent, uh, which is running, looking for um, uh, malicious data that might have been injected in the build. We've got static analysis, lint analysis. Uh, as well as the actual build process. I showed you the testing. that We actually execute those binaries. We check the libraries. We check the SO files. We ensure that Python modules are loadable, Ruby modules are loadable uh, and listable. And then you know, we've got logs that we can, we can drill into. So how does that work in practice? Uh, and for those of you who might be prospects and not yet customers, maybe, maybe it sounds great, but you, know, you, you don't believe us yet. Uh, Dan mentioned in the keynote, we've got over 1,200 images, again, these images were taken a couple of weeks ago. This was at uh, 1,254 images, 1,200 and counting. Um, there's a handful of different types of images that we've sort of grouped things into. We've got some customers who are more interested in the AI front. Uh, others are more interested in the base or the, the starter front. Um, we've got, you know, some, some customers who use a single image and they, they start there. We've got others that leverage a handful, five or 10 images and, and get started. Um, and then we've got some other uh, customers who've gone all in on this and ChainGuard is the only way uh, that, uh, that their developers are allowed to, to build uh, on or they're encouraged to, to use. All right, so it's the factory that enables all of this at scale. Um, now, what we heard from uh, a number of customers uh, over the last year was, you know that thing that you've done for containers 
can you do that for our virtual machines and our, our libraries? Uh, in particular, on the virtual machine front, uh, we had some customers who said, look, this is great. We've deployed ChainGuard everywhere. We can deploy it inside of the containers, but those containers are running on uh, Amazon Linux uh, hosts in AWS or EKS. They're a couple of years old. There's hundreds of unpatched vulnerabilities. I feel great about my container estate, but what about what about the, the, the thing running under my containers? And I've got hundreds of thousands of those. Uh, the other thing we heard is, this is this is cool, but as the first thing my developer does is starts with a chain guard base image and then adds git and then goes and git clones some other third party repository and then starts pulling in libraries or uses pip install or npm install or maven install uh, to go and pull third party libraries into their code. Uh, and so for all of the effort that the security team has done to secure the base, uh, it's perhaps for naught if they're going to go and plug in that USB stick that they found on the, on the sidewalk. Uh, so the first one to you know, just mention is that same factory, everything that I've talked about that powers the packages and the images front, we've extended to also produce virtual machine images. Uh, that meant that we had to add a couple of packages we didn't have before. The other piece are our libraries. Uh, and we started very much with Java. Uh, the signal that we got was Java was the biggest pain point in uh, some of the enterprise, especially financial services, healthcare, government organizations. Uh, and this idea that everything that, 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 that these, um, these technologists are getting from a trusted source is great, but there's this other realm of dependencies that aren't as well understood yet, perhaps, by, uh, by the scanners, number one, uh, and by their developers, number two. Uh, but I, I can guarantee you that the malicious actors out there in the world absolutely know about this. And uh, you know, there's, there's a, a long list of bodies, a, a trail of bodies, um, where pulling in code from an untrusted third party uh, has created uh, real vulnerabilities. So we've started rebuilding Java itself, Java archives, jars, uh, from source. Uh, to date, we've got 20,000 jars. Uh, which include, from our analysis, the most heavily depended upon jars across the last five years. Uh, and this covers about 98, 99% of uh, the most used jars over the last uh, five years in uh, independencies. Um, if it's not on the list, we, can, we have a process by which we can add others as well. Um, Java is the start. We're working on uh, Python uh, next. Uh, PyPI is, is the, the next target. Uh, that's a work in progress, and definitely come talk to us if you're interested in that. So that's containers, VMs, libraries, all built from source the hard way. Uh, it's that same factory that I've spent the last 30, 40 minutes talking about cranking through that. Uh, and then ultimately, it's the ChainGuard operating system that's powering all of this. Uh, it's at the core of it. It's not uh, the it's it's not the the value that we project as. Um, you know, the, the thing that we've built, but it's the thing behind what we've built that enables all of this to go uh, and go really fast.